hear so much these days about unconscious bias, conscious bias, racism, structural racism. But how often do we really try and understand what these definitions mean? What girds them? What each of our contributions are to sustaining these problems? And most importantly, how do we go about affecting real and, sust and sustainable change? Jessica Nordell in her new book, the End of Bias, A Beginning, The Science and Practice of Overcoming Unconscious Bias does a fantastic job of taking our hand and educating us, using clear language, scientific studies, journalistic chops, and an abiding sense of curiosity and a desire to find solutions. I wondered what kind of background would contribute to a book so grounded in science so elegantly written and with a sense of optimism in the face of such stubborn, intractable problems? Well, I found the answer in Jessica's unique background, a physics degree from Harvard, an award for the best new poet, a comedy writer for Prairie Home Companion, and essays that have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. With that kind of skill set, how could we not want to hear what she has to say? Jessica, welcome to Just the Right Book. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, Jessica, later in the interview, we'll talk um, about your unusual array of skills. I was I was pretty fascinated with that, so I don't want to I don't want to lose that. But let's get started with what I think is the fundamental uh, question. What is um, unconscious bias and how can our behavior be at odds with our values? When we talk about unconscious bias, we're talking about this sort of sequence of events that happens as a result of living in a particular culture at a particular time. So as we grow up in a culture, we learn what categories of people are salient in that culture, really. And then we also learn associations and stereotypes that are attached to those categories. And what happens with unconscious bias is that when we encounter a person or a situation that um, we recognize as belonging to one of those categories, all of those associations and stereotypes that we've stored in our memory start to influence the interaction that we're having. I mean, even the interaction you, you and I are having right now might be being influenced in ways that we're not necessarily aware of by associations and stereotypes that we've accumulated over our lives. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really important about whether you want to call it unconscious bias or unintentional bias, there's some a few different terms that, that we can use, but the important thing about it is that it can happen so quickly and so automatically that we don't even realize that these stereotypes are influencing the way that we're reacting, the way we feel, the way we talk and behave. So it can happen really fast and without our awareness. And the other thing that's really important is that these behaviors can conflict with our values, with our professed values. So we can believe ourselves to be egalitarian and fair-minded and really want to treat people equally. We could hold that as a value, but yet we can be susceptible to being influenced in ways that we're not necessarily aware of and that really go against those values that we hold to be really important. And Jessica, the thing that was so powerful in really understanding, and we'll, we'll go into some of the examples and studies that you have about that is, you know, my observation and even my experience is that, you know, particularly around all the conversations we've had about race and racism, that those of us that are white start to feel that we don't think of ourselves as biased. We, we certainly think of ourselves in a way that's open to all the possibilities and wanting equality. And if we get accused of being racist, 
or biased. Most of us are not capable of sort of getting beyond the defensiveness of that. I mean, not that that's right, but it's, it's a challenge. And what I think is so liberating that you talk about is that it can be that you are informed by all of this history and stereotyping and still be a person who has the value that they believe they have. Absolutely. I mean, I think that in, I mean, we have to keep in mind that toxic ideas about racial hierarchy are hundreds of years old. Right. You know, toxic ideas about sex hierarchy and patriarchal, you know, men's superiority over women are thousands of years old. So these ideas are so old and embedded in our lived, you know, environment, the built environment, um, the, the structure of neighborhoods, you know, the structure of workplaces. It, it's really, it's almost like um, there's this philosopher who talks about the idea of a hyper object, which is a phenomenon that is so big, you can't even see it. And I think that racism and yeah. sexism kind of operate like, like these hyper objects, they're so big that we can't see them. So I think that within that, you know, that I think it's essential that we both work to overcome those inheritances and that we don't pass them on or act them out toward one another. And also I think it's important to have self-compassion for the fact that we are inheritors of a toxic legacy really. And, you know, we, it doesn't really do anyone any good to, to, to be defensive and to kind of deny that this is a problem. But it does, I think you're right, you know, it does require a certain level of emotional skill and emotional sort of maturity to be able to say, yes, I'm susceptible to these things, but I, I can move beyond it. And so let's talk about a couple of examples of it before we start talking about how you might identify it or begin to, since it's quick, it's it's a challenge to very quickly recognize what's going on. But let's talk about two sort of straightforward examples that you come up with. One, which I found fascinating, and I'm not sure I'm going to say his name correctly, is Ben Barr. Is it Barris or Barr? Barris, yeah, Barris. Barris. So share with us that story and what he learned. So Ben Barris is such an interesting, he, he had such an interesting story and was really an incredible human being. He um, transitioned in his 40s. He was a neurobiologist and had, uh, had always sort of assumed that sexism was a thing of the past, didn't really think that he had experienced sexism before his transition. And what he found was that when he started being, when he was seen by the rest of the world as Ben, instead of as his, as, as a woman, which is how he had been, you know, he had been seen earlier, um, he noticed an almost immediate change in the way he was treated. I mean, he, he had been worried that transitioning, changing gender would, uh, would result in people leaving his lab or not being invited, you know, him not being invited to scientific conferences. And fortunately, he was in a very privileged position in that he he didn't lose his job or face a lot of the things that trans many transgender people face. Um, but what he found was that he started being uh, listened to more. He wasn't interrupted in meetings anymore. He was given the benefit of the doubt. There, at a conference, one scientist was overheard saying, Ben gave a really great presentation today, but his, his research is so much better than his sister's. <laughs> and he was, he was really shocked. He really didn't realize the extent to which his everyday experiences had mm. been tinted by the gender that he was perceived as having. He really didn't have any idea. And I, I had several conversations with him about it. And he said, you know, I don't think it's until people actually experience it themselves that they really realize what's going on. And many people still don't realize what's going on. Well, what's interesting to me about that example is, you know, whenever any of these kinds of things come up, they go, well, 
you can't control for variables. Well, it's the same damn person, right? Exactly. He's just now it's just that he's a man. Exactly. And, you know, even with that, what see almost is like a controlled experiment because the only thing's changing is the gender he's presenting as. Even within that, you know, I've heard people say, well, maybe he was more confident. Maybe there are other reasons. Yeah. They no, try to put in a variable. Exactly. But the interesting thing is that if it's about confidence and feeling like, you know, he, he was able to live in a way that felt more true to himself and, you know, he was able to sort of live out his integrity more, then you would expect the same thing would be true for people who transition in the opposite direction. So right. That, but, but they don't. They have the opposite experience. Yeah. Right. And, and you just quickly ran into the same thing early on as a journalist submitting articles. And, you know, J.D. did a lot better than Jessica. Yeah, you know, I, yes, and I, I was really shocked. You know, I was a young journalist just sort of getting my feet wet. I'd been working for local and regional magazines and trying to break into national publications, not getting traction, not hearing back from editors. And it was really, I think I was about 25 in a moment of desperation. There was an essay that, you know, was pegged to a news story that was going to not be relevant uh, within days. I just sort of quickly created a new email address and sent the same pitch out as J.D. Nordell instead of Jessica Nordell. And the piece was accepted within a few hours, which was shocking wow. to me. I didn't, I really didn't think it was going to work. And again, you know, people could say, well, who knows, maybe the editor was having an off day the other days. I mean, there are lots of extenuating, you know, factors, but when you start to look at the research and see that these things are validated empirically over and over, then I think the story becomes a lot more clear. So speaking of empirical, um, you uh, spend a chapter talking about uh, Patricia Devine and um, she had convinced her um, advisor about her dissertation and then thought she blew it uh, because the data just didn't make any sense. And in fact, her studies have been pretty groundbreaking. So share with us why she thought the data couldn't be right. And what did we learn about her work from that? Yeah, so she was expecting to see that, okay, and now actually this is a moment where I have to, ref I just have to quickly look to make sure that I, I have all the details exactly right. Cause I'm a stickler. Take for, your time. For facts here. Um, Yeah, so she, right, so she basically, she was trying to see whether people who said that they were not racist were telling the truth. And what she did was she primed uh, subjects with a bunch of subliminal sort of words to trigger the idea of, um, African-Americans in the mind. And then she had other subjects who were not subliminally triggered um, or subliminally primed with those words or messages. And what she was hoping to see, what she thought she was gonna see was that the people who were subliminally primed with messages would, it's a little bit of a complicated study, but mm -hmm. she, <laughs> she then sh showed, that she, so after the subliminal priming, she then, um, showed them, uh, she gave them a, a story to interpret. And she thought that those who, um, those who were subliminally primed, who had beforehand said they weren't prejudiced, wouldn't interpret the story in a biased way. Because she right. thought, well, those people, um, if they're telling the truth, that means that if we prime them and then we, um, we show them the story, that priming is not going to have any effect on the way that they interpret the story. But what she found was that no matter what people said, whether they said that they were, uh, whether they revealed bias ahead of time or didn't reveal bias, when they were subliminally primed with ideas that 
triggered African Americans, they interpreted the story in a more biased way. So what this showed, which was really the first time it had been proven scientifically, was that even when people were not um, aware of these messages, of these associations that were coming into their mind, they were still being influenced by these messages and acting in biased ways. So she, she, she thought that the experiment was uh, a disaster, but it turned out to actually reveal something that people hadn't really understood before, which is that you can actually respond automatically in a biased way without even realizing that it's happening. And was that the first time? Because to me, it sounded like that became sort of the support system to understanding what unconscious bias is, because, it, it, you know, people tried to say, oh, no, they were lying that they were this or that, but it wasn't. I think she called it the prejudicial paradox. Yeah, I mean, right. So the, well, what she realized was that prejudice could be a habit, that it could be, autom right. something could be automatically triggered without, um, without, uh, without awareness. And right before that, there was this sort of paradox, which was that people claimed to be not racist, but then they would behave in ways that were biased when they were observed in a lab. And so before Trish Devine came along, people thought, well, that means they must be lying. People are just trying to preserve their self-image and, you know, appear to be more egalitarian than they really are. And her work was really the, the first time that there was evidence that people might actually be telling the truth. They might actually be sincerely uh, believing in egalitarianism, but then still be able to be um, susceptible to these like automatic responses. So Jessica, one of the examples that you uh, give for how stereotypes are reinforced, I actually was shocked by. And that was the example of the advertising campaign for Straight out of Compton. So share with us how the clever marketers of that film, um, it, so if I'm uh, black and I went to, was it advertised on Facebook or what ad would pop up for me? Yeah, this was, it was really shocking to me as well. So if you were scrolling through Facebook and I think it was spring of 2015, um, there was a trailer that came up for the movie Straight Outta Compton, which was like a biopic about the, um, the rap group w. in the UA. Yeah. And if you were white, you would have seen a, a whole sort of um, pasty, a whole sort of mix of images that were extremely stereotype, stereotypical images. So you would have seen um, if within the first few seconds, um, men with guns, um, a black man face down on the pavement, someone pulling a gun out of a duffel bag, you know, sort of these stereo really stereotypical images of uh, criminality associated with African Americans. And if you were Black, you would have seen a completely different first uh, section of the trailer. You would have seen um, the real life members of NWA driving through the streets of Compton, you would have seen something that looked much more like a documentary. And then later you would have seen clips from the film. But this was the first time Facebook used what it called ethnic affinity marketing. So they actually figured out what ethnic group you belonged to and then showed you a different trailer from the movie, depending on what Facebook identified as your ethnic group. And they were very different trailers. And it worked. It worked, yeah. The movie was a success. Man, oh man. And imagine, that was in 15, imagine how much more sophisticated the opportunity to do that now is. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, were you, were you surprised? I... I was, yeah, I was surprised. I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't, didn't realize the extent to which the marketers would use yeah. um, stereotypes sort of strategically in that way, or what appeared to be strategically. 
you, you know, the other um, examples that you give are in the school system, particularly how black kids were treated for the same behavior as white kids, particularly black boys. Share with us one of those stories because that was equally disturbing. Yeah, you know, there's so many stories of bias in the education system, particularly around punishment for infractions. There was one study in Texas of where they looked at millions of school records and found that uh, black students were, and here again, I'm gonna just check and make sure that I have the numbers exactly right. Um, it found that black students were more than twice as likely to be suspended the first time they violated the rules. So white students might have suffered suspension the second time they violated the rules, but black students were twice as likely to be suspended the first time they violated the rules. And this really, you know, this was really brought to life for me in the story of a young boy named JJ Powell, who was a preschooler and experienced suspension from school. His mother assumed, I guess this is what happens with preschoolers. They get suspended if they, you know, behave badly. And she didn't think anything was really awry until she met other parents and talked to them about their ch children's behavior. Their children had also behaved badly, had also, you know. One of them uh, had sent a kid to a hospital. <laughs> one sent a kid to a hospital. Like a five-year-old. <laughs> exactly. And none of these kids were suspended. And the only difference she could tell was that those children were white and her son was black. Hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of controversy now about um, teaching critical race theory in curriculums. And the pushback is that it's making white kids feel like they're racist and, and, and doing bad things and therefore they don't want it taught, or that's the ostensible reason. But talk about the way in which all of us understanding our history makes is, is one of the first pieces of our undoing stereotypes. It's really essential. And you know, it was so interesting, Roxanne, because I found as I was researching this book and as I was really immersed in the history and trying to understand where these ideas come from and how they travel through time and arrive in our minds and hearts to this day, I found that the more I understood history, the more I really understood the origin of these ideas, the more I was able to see the presence of these ideas in my mind, in the behaviors of myself and others, and the and kind of the, the more I was able to hold them more loosely, I, was, I, I felt like I was able to let them go more easily. And I, I discovered that there's actually a, a, word, a, a term for this. There's actually a phenomenon that's been explored called the Marley hypothesis, which has found that as people learn more about history, as they learn particularly about history of racial discrimination, they're more able to recognize it in the present. And the more, you know, awareness is sort of the first step of agency, of being able to change. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm really um, of the firm belief that learning history is essential. And then I think also, you know, learning history can start to hopefully uh, loosen some of that unhelpful shame and guilt, you know, um, because we will, you know, we see then how, how old these ideas are, how, how deep of an inheritance they are and how they didn't, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't start with us. We didn't start the fire, but you know, we're, we're the firefighters now. So we need to be working on the problem. You know, when the worry I think is that are the real conversations taking place. I mean, one of the things I loved about your book is I think it's a good, um, you know, it's like a good book club book on, on how to think about this because 
you know, I, I don't know if this is going to come out a little bit um, convoluted, but, you know, one of the things I always find when people pick a book for book club is they can talk about something because they're going to use the character. Say, you know, isn't that bit, isn't that Betsy a little bitchy? You know, isn't she a little meddlesome? And so you you use the fake character, and it seems to me that in your book, using these studies should be an entry point because what I observe, not including my own behavior, is if I'm in a conversation um, with someone who is not in what we'll say is my social identity group. So we'll start with the easiest, they're black and I'm white, that I find I might check myself on what I want to say because it will would reveal a bias mm -hmm. or it would reveal a stereotype. But what I worry about is if we don't really get over that hump and have those conversations, then I'm at risk of holding on to that stereotype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Do you see how that can be overcome, or do you see that as a problem? I do. You know, I think that one of the one of the findings that was really stark to me was the incredible power of forming meaningful connections with people of different mm. identity groups in the context of a shared goal, in the context of a collaborative experience where people are working together as equals, equal status toward some kind of common goal. And I think that, you know, what the research shows is that in those contexts, stereotypes and um, biased behavior sort of start to fall away. We start to see one another as, as complex as ourselves, and we are able to kind of let go of some of those stereotypes. And I would guess, and I don't know if this has been studied, but I would guess that in that context, it's a lot easier to have these sorts of honest conversations because... You begin to trust each other. You begin to trust each other. Yeah. And you, you know, don't you know, self-conscious. Yeah. Do you know Beverly Tatum? She wrote, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? I interviewed her and I read that book when it first came out, which was, I think, 20 something years ago and loved it. And I got the opportunity uh, to interview her and she's just an extraordinary woman. But uh, one of the, th she lives in Atlanta and to your point, one of the experiments or, or things, activities that they started is what they call the friendship club, meaning a group of people would agree to just even once invite someone from another group that they weren't friends with to coffee or lunch. And that the exponential impact of that, to your point, is powerful. Mm -hmm. it, you know, because well, another thing, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record because I'll say, oh, I found this interesting. I found that interesting. But in fact, I did. So one of the things that you bring up that hadn't quite occurred to me is that when we describe whatever group we come from, we see ourselves. So I'm Jewish. Right. So I see I don't see Jews as a monolithic group. I see them for all the different ranges of qualities that any human being has. Right. I don't think, oh, all Jews do this or all Jews do that. Yet what you talk about is when we look at groups we don't know, we think they're homogenous. Mm -hmm. And what have you seen in studies or observations about that, that reinforce that idea? It's so interesting. Yeah, I, I found that to be really interesting research as well. I mean, and I think we, we see it in ourselves, you know, I, I completely can see how any social group that I belong to, just as you said, like, I see it as totally diverse and yeah. you know, people are complex and different and the research shows that the groups that we don't belong to, we see as much more 
homogenous. And I think even just knowing that is so powerful because if you can stop and think, wait a second, that group is just as diverse and complex as my group. There are as many range, you know, as big of a range of opinions, as a big of a range of backgrounds and, you know, personalities and roles as my group. That's really powerful. I mean, it's a lot harder to stereotype people if you understand that. And yeah, there's some, were you asking about research about this or? Yeah. So we even talk about like the blue and yellow shirts in the kids. The blue and yellow. Well, what I was actually thinking about, can I, can I share a, a different? Yeah. Whatever. Kind of, Honey, you're the author. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking, I thought one study that was really fascinating about this was, I don't know if you remember this, but um, the, the study about the poster with the Arab faces. Oh, yes. And the names. And so these researchers, briefly, these researchers were looking to see um, whether it would make an impact uh, if they showed, if they hung a poster, this was in France where there's a lot of anti-Arab sentiment. If they hung a poster of faces of um, different individuals of Arab origin, and then they put a description of that person under the photo. So they would have a person's name and then a description like optimistic or cheerful or friendly. And they had one study where they had the posters that all had sort of positive attributes assigned to them. And then they had a version where they had posters that had... Um, positive and negative attributes. So, you know, happy, optimistic, you know, stingy, unfriendly, like all of these sort of different attributes. And they found that when people had been exposed to the poster where the attributes were all mixed up and there were positive and negative and all sorts of attributes in between, people behaved in a less biased way when they were encountering someone of Arab origin afterwards. Mm. So they did all sorts of experiments where they had someone like a, a woman who was a partner of the researchers who was of Arab origin spill her purse and they looked to see how many people helped her clean up the you know belongings. Um, they did one where they had people uh, in a physical therapist's office and they looked to see how close people would sit to the individual of Arab origin after they'd seen this poster. And they found that it was actually being faced with the diversity within a group that was more impactful than just seeing a list of positive attributes. Such a simple, you know, it seems so simple. I mean, the other thing that you remind us of, which I, I, I don't know that I would have thought of, is that if a Muslim commits a crime, that we attribute that to their religion. Whereas if a Christian white person commits a crime, we ascribe it to their personal pathology. Exactly. Um, and I assume we do that if we're white and not Muslim. Yeah, I mean, if the, the media, you know, that presents these stories is largely controlled by, by white people and so if they see a white person committing a crime, they don't see themselves as being part of that person's group. You know, they see that as, a, as an aberration from the group. But if it's someone from another group who commits a crime, then I think this concept of out-group homogeneity sort of comes into play and, and uh, the group is seen as monolithic and the person committing the crime is, you know, a member of that group. I mean, it seems to me even that simple thing that when we now like right after someone listens to this interview or attended this event, that if they read about someone committing a crime, that they would make note of where their brain went. Yes. Um, and because since I finished the book, there are like little subtle things that I find I'm paying attention to in a slightly different way. Really? Can you say, yeah. I'm curious, like what? Well, I, I think one is this thing where um, you're reading about a crime um, is one. And the other is, I would swear, I don't think another group that I don't belong to is homogeneous. I would swear I, I don't, but I bet I do. And so I think about that now. You know, it was, I, I remember somebody telling me this, that if you read about a crime, 
the first thing you do is try to separate yourself from the crime. I wouldn't be out two o'clock in the morning. Why was she wearing a low cut blouse? What was she doing in that neighborhood? You know, all these things quickly. And that dehumanizes the person that it happened to, right? Because they're, they're not doing what you, the thoughtful, careful person would do. Mm -hmm. So they're somehow culpable. So I, I, and I think it extends to that notion extends to what, how, what attributes we attribute to people who have committed a crime or seemingly are the object of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, so now we're coming to a place where we are recommitting to that diversity training. We're getting that we need to do something. Now, I feel a lot of times that there is a kind of a checking of the box uh, of this being done. It's um, even if they believe in it, they don't really think diversity training really worked, but I, you know what, we got to do it. So does it work? What is working? What is it we need to do with diversity training to really start moving the needle on a change? So interesting. You know, I think <laughs> this is a really big topic. Um, I think there are a couple of challenges with diversity training as it's practice now. And you've touched on a big one, which is that it can be used as sort of a box checking, sort of cover your bases, you know, make sure we're compliant with legal requirements kind of thing. And it can create the appearance of change without actual change. So that's a big challenge. But I think maybe even behind, if we step back even a step further, one of the big challenges is, is, is that a lot of these trainings haven't been evaluated. So mm. we're sort of bringing in, whoops, we're sort of bringing in, um, uh, you know, an intervention, almost like a medical intervention, <laughs> right. an intervention that's never been evaluated. Not only has it not been evaluated, but it's often not even clear what the goals are. Like, what, what are you trying to do with this? Mm -hmm. Um, and if you, if you don't evaluate these trainings, then they could be making things better. They could be making things worse. They could be having no effect at all. And we often just don't know because so many of them are not evaluated. So those are some of the big challenges with diversity training. On the other hand, there are some approaches that have been evaluated, a much more limited uh, range. I mean, this is a problem with anti-prejudice interventions in general. I think there was one meta-analysis that found that only 11% of anti-prejudice interventions have ever been tested in a rigorous way outside of a laboratory. So, mm. you know, we, 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 there's really a lot of work that needs to be done to figure out um, more about what works. But, but there are some approaches that have been shown to change people's behavior. Um, and it's tricky because there's also research that suggests that when diversity trainings are mandatory, this can create backlash. Um, and uh, and if they're voluntary, the, the women show up. Or if they're the, voluntary, the people who are affected. Or, the, or the person who's been harmed shows up. The people who are harmed show up. That was, so which I mean, is that better. Was, which is like, better to do. I'm sorry? Which is better to do. Um, voluntary or, or mandatory? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I want to be super prescriptive about this because I haven't done this. I haven't done an <clears throat> analysis, you know, side by side analysis um, study myself. But uh, the, the, I mean, the good news about the voluntary approach is that we as humans are very susceptible to social norms. So if a group of people voluntarily go to a training that's effective, that's been shown to work, and then they start to change their behavior, advocate for new policies, you know, start to kind of shift as a result of that training, and that becomes the norm, then that can spread. And that, that's been found to be the case in research. So if, if we as humans see a certain behavior as being popular and really common and what sort of the people who are influential are doing, 
we're more likely to do it. So it's sort of like a backdoor, <laughs> sort of a backdoor into bringing people into these trainings, even if they haven't been there themselves. Yeah. I mean, what I worry about is, you know, it almost made me think there's a bias against diversity training. Now I hear, I see a lot of rolling of eyes when people say, yeah, I got to sign on to my diversity uh, training. And I worry that that's actually, you know, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but I mean, you do have one example um, in the book that I thought was interesting that's not just about diversity training, but about a broader issue. There was a guy in France, Jean Marco Monsolato. I'm yeah. probably killing the poor man's name. Uh, but he he was a partner in a French firm called Taj. Mm -hmm. And based on what he did, which I'd like you to share with us, because I've never seen results like this. Eight years later, 50% of the women, 50% uh, of the partners were, were women. Mm -hmm. And 19% is generally the number and his earnings grew 70%. So what were the critical elements that he put in place to effectuate that change? Because I know when I was a partner in an accounting firm 30 something years ago, and there weren't that many women, I'd get invited to give these talks about, okay, well, how do you make women partners? <laughs> like, like it's like flipping a switch, but he really did it. Yeah, and I can tell you it wasn't through diversity training. <laughs> Um, he, and, and importantly, it was not through coaching women to be more, you know, uh, assertive, to be more assertive, to change, you know, their behavior in the workplace, to negotiate harder. He said to me, I mean, when I interviewed him, he said, the problem is not the women. The problem is the environment. And I think what made Gianmarco Mazzolato so unique, what makes him so unique is that he was not motivated by box checking. He wasn't motivated by trying to look good or trying to make you know numbers look appealing for some kind of PR purpose. He really, he what he really saw was that his firm wasn't actually capturing all the available talent. And his firm wasn't doing that well at the time that he became the CEO. So he kind of had this realization that he, he actually, they were putting artificial barriers in front of really talented lawyers. And if the firm was going to succeed, they needed to, they needed to do things differently. So what he did was he really systematically looked at all of the places where women were being blocked from advancing in the firm. And one of them was um, that they, you know, they had a, uh, sort of a, an idea about FaceTime, like people really needed to be in the office all the time. And women who had children would be penalized for working part-time or leaving early, even if they were delivering the same results. So he shifted sort of the evaluation criteria to really be looking at results only and not any of these other things. Um, he actively promoted women to senior positions. And he said, if you don't like the position after a period of time, you can go back to your previous position. So he kind of eliminated the risk of moving into a position that was new. Cause he said some of these lawyers would, they kind of worried that if they, if they ascended in the hierarchy and it didn't work out, then they would have lost some of their technical expertise. Mm -hmm. So they could be sort of in a bad situation. So he really said, you know, I, I want to eliminate that risk. So I'm going to give you this option. Um, and he created he he created sort of a zero tolerance policy for biased words and behaviors in the workplace. And it really, I mean, I think what was really remarkable about him is that it really came from a belief that this was essential to the functioning of his organization. It wasn't like yeah. to be nice. It wasn't kind of out of a sense of noblesse oblige. It was really. I mean, um, it was business. It was business. Yeah. It was actually business, which, you know, there have been studies which you talk about in the book that aren't necessarily as conclusive as we'd all like them to be, that adding diversity to your board, to your organization, uh, improves uh, business. But 
I think the way he did it, where he really understood, no, this is about making sure we're developing talent in the best way possible. Yeah, and I think it's a really important point about the business case for diversity, because I actually, and I think this is important to emphasize, it's not that simple. So I think people sort of like to believe, oh, you just add, you know, you add women and everything's great, or you add people of all sorts of different social identities and, you know, you sort of unlock the, the magic of diversity. And it actually doesn't work that way because all of the power dynamics in the world can be easily replicated in the workplace. So you could bring, you could have a, you know, create a diverse workforce and still have all of the influence be concentrated in a very small group of people and still have, you know, an environment where not everyone is able to feel safe or feel uh, like their, you know, ideas are being heard. But what's, what I think is really powerful is there is research that shows that when everyone feels like they can learn, when there's an environment of psychological safety and learning, then diversity does have these excellent advantages. So it's not as simple as both. You need both. You need both. I mean, because if you did it, if you did the, if you did the latter without bringing in the diversity, it's sort of, you know, speaking to an empty auditorium. Um, Well, and not only that, but I mean, I think something that I, another thing that I found really interesting was some researchers have started to notice that actually when we talk about diversity, we're kind of acting as though the baseline is just neutral, like Mm. homogeneity is just neutral. And in fact, homogeneity has a lot of consequences. Like homogenous juries don't consider as many facts when deciding cases, for instance. So I think it's kind of important that we start shifting the conversation just from just talking about diversity to talking about, well, what are the consequences of having homogenous environments too? Mm. I, I think that's a really good point. So we have um, a couple, of, I'm going to go a little bit over because I want to make sure that we get um, to two things. You live in Minnesota and um, there are, there's been some very problematic behavior in Minnesota with the police And I realized when I was reading the book that I had not paid as much of attention, as much attention to the case of Philando Castile and Falcon Heights as the George Floyd case. And when I read the circumstances of his shooting, and at the moment that the the policeman, I think his name was Yanez, shot him seven times. I had a physical reaction. So share that story with us because that involves both how we train our police, how the pressures that our policemen are under, the the incredible stereotyping uh, that goes on and how this guy didn't have a chance no matter what he did in that car. It was really uh, a perfect storm um, that led to Philando Castile's killing. Um, So Philando Castile was a a Montessori nutrition supervisor in Falcon Heights. And in 2016, he was driving down the street with his girlfriend and her daughter and um, another a policeman named Geronimo Yanez had gotten a call that there was a burglary suspect um, that they were looking for. And he saw Yanez drive by and thought he looked like the burglary suspect. So he pulled him over. And in the space of, I think it was 70 seconds between the time he got out of the car, he, he shot Mr. Castile. And Later, um, you know, a lot of information came out about Yanez's prior state of sort of decompensation. Um, He had been not 
performing well for a while. Um, he, uh, when he, he, he said on, in his trial, he, he said that he saw Mr. Castile uh, doing things that seemed suspicious to him. And he basically went into what police called the black zone. He basically stopped functioning and automatically shot Mr. Castile and killed him. And, um, you know, when I, when I was really trying to understand what, what happened in this situation, it seemed that, you know, just as you said, moment by moment, there were many, many different factors that came into play here from Yanez training. He'd been trained to see the world as a, a as a dangerous place. He'd taken a, a train called Warrior Training by Dave Grossman, uh, the Bulletproof Warrior, which trains cops to feel that they're in a, a live, I can't remember what uh, the words were, the live ammo battle every day. Um, uh, he... Um, You know, he clearly had, he clearly stereotyped um, Mr. Castile immediately upon seeing him. He um, had, it sounded like very little cognitive control, very little ability to overcome his own impulsive um, biased reactions. And yeah, it was a, it was a complete disaster. And it, it was, there was nothing that, a Philando did no. to prompt that action. He asked for his insurance, his license. Philando was licensed to carry a gun. You're, yeah, yeah. you're required to say that to the police. He, he gave him his insurance card. He told him he had a gun. And then he reached for his wallet, mm -hmm. not for his gun. Yes. And the policeman could clearly see that he didn't. But the thing that's hard to accept is he was found not guilty. Yeah. And this line between behavior that policemen have to do with circumstances like this are such a skinny, seemingly skinny line about they're doing what they're expected to do in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus reacting to either a conscious or an unconscious bias and and then from a place of fear. And I mean, he shot him seven times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there was no visible gun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, yeah. I mean, the standard that they're held to is a reasonable officer would consider, uh, you know, that their life would be in danger. And, um, there was, there was no reason for him to believe that his life was in danger except racist stereotyping. I mean, that's the only reason that he would have made that expectation. And, you know, he was so overcome with, um, you know, his mind really, you know, was so, had ceased functioning that he was actually unable to even give um, clear commands. So Mr. Castile was actually, he was responding exactly to what he'd been asked to do, um, but the the commands were not clear, and um, and yeah, it was. A so the the last thing I want to cover before we spend a couple of minutes on possibility of solution. So obviously, a hot topic is defunding the police, changing the way uh, the police are. Trained. You talk about a very interesting um, project that was done in LA by Connie Rice and the LAPD called the Community Safety Partnership, which seems to have made a substantial difference. And and I wonder if you could share with us what it is and whether you think that does start to present the prototype of what should go on in our communities? Well, I think it's a really interesting story because Connie Rice is this sort of larger than life character. She's a civil rights lawyer who spent, oh, I think by the time she launched this project, she'd been 
suing LAPD for discrimination for over a decade. And what she came to realize was that she needed, if she really wanted to make a difference, she needed to go inside the organization. And it was too powerful of an organization for her to be able to really make headway um, on just litigating. She said lit litigation is powerful, but it's not enough. And it doesn't change behavior, actually. It doesn't change hearts. Um, and so, so what she very sort of cagely figured out how to do was to um, line up the, the sort of people and processes that she needed to start this new initiative called the Community Safety Partnership. And one of her motivations was that, I mean, when I talked to her, she explained that she, she was also working, doing a lot of anti-discrimination work for clients. And, but the violence in where some of these clients were living was so high that her, her clients would sometimes be killed. And she said, you know, other kinds of discrimination are important, but if I can't even preserve the lives of my clients, then the other kinds of discrimination are, are you know, irrelevant. Like what we need to do is preserve this safety. So she, um, and what she saw also was that it was actually the lack of trust between the community and the police that was contributing to um, a lack of safety. So long story short, the program that she started um, was kind of radical in that the officers were instructed to change their goals, basically. She changed the incentive. So instead of being told you're, you're going to be evaluated based on the number of arrests you make, the cops were told you're going to be evaluated based on whether you are forming relationships, the quality of your relationships, and whether you are treating members of the community like your own family. That was, those were sort of their marching orders. And, um, you know, this was kind of a hard sell for police, but she had, they, the group that set it up had handpicked a small number, I think 40, 40 cops to start this project who were at least open to the idea. And, yeah, I mean, they they did a whole number of different um, activities to really try to develop trust and to kind of undo what decades of really broken and violent policing by LAPD had created. And I mean, the results were pretty interesting. The reason that I included it, because I'm a sort of a skeptical journalist and I really only wanted to include things that had rigorous science behind them. And what, what I found compelling about the CSP program was that two independent um, organizations evaluated this program. And they found that 10 years after the program started, it had made a real impact on people's feeling of safety, on the trust, the level of trust that people had between the community and the police. Um, it had changed police behavior, which was one of the goals. So that it had decreased the number of arrests that were made, but it had also decreased violent crime. So I think one thing that's kind of interesting about this program is it shows that there doesn't have to be this choice of like status quo policing mm -hmm. or, you know, violent crime. Like you can actually make meaningful changes and also handle um, and also tackle rising violent crime as well. And have you heard of other cities looking to LAPD's, this program and trying to scale it or adopt it? I know that LAPD has, um, has expanded it in the last year. The, one of the people who was kind of the architect of the program, Amata Tingarides, is now the head of a division. So it's, it's been turned into its own division um, with multiple more projects. I don't know of other cities that are following that blueprint per se. That's not to say there aren't any. I, I'm just not aware yeah. of other cities. Yeah. So, you know, sadly, um, we've run out of time. And um, I, I, I think the um, solution to that is that people need to just read every page of the book. But let me close with this question. You know, as you said, you're a skeptical journalist, you're a scientist. Um, and as I said in the introduction, you, the, the book is an intersection 
of um, good journalism and science. So did you finish the project? I mean, you worked on this for six years, I think. Yeah, almost six years. Did you come away hopeful that um, this might be a moment in time where we will scientifically try to figure out solutions? Or did you come away feeling like this is such a big, complicated, hundreds-year-old problem and we can at best chip away at the edges? I came away with a stronger sense of urgency about this problem. I came away with a sense that we have the capacity to change this problem because as I share in the book, there are lots of pockets of places where change is happening. I also came away with a really strong understanding that scientific or technical solutions are not enough because any solution is only as strong as the mindset of the people who are in charge. Yeah. And whether you're talking about a workplace or whether you're talking about a police force or whether you're talking about, you know, an educate a school system, if the people at the top don't understand how essential this work is and how much is being lost through discrimination and bias, it's 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 hard for those solutions to take root. But I've also seen cases where people like Jean, Car Jean Marco Mansolato, who really did understand how important it is and what the potential for, for growth and change is. And in those cases, there's a huge amount of potential. So I feel like, I don't know if I have a great answer to your question, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like, I want to say to the listeners, like, it's up to you, you know, it's up to, it's yeah. up to all of us. Um, it's in our hands. Well, you know, you know, that is an interesting point, Jessica, because a lot of people I've spoken to and with nonprofit work that I do, I am reminded that we don't have to boil the ocean and that each one of us live in a community yes. and each one of us are can be part of a solution, even if it's, you know, three people. Yes. And I think books like yours that remind us to think carefully about what stereotypes are driving us and driving well-intentioned people is a big leap, right? It's a, it's a big leap. And so I'm going to close with your words since your words are better than my words. Um, and in your book, you write, where one human meets another is an edge, a place in the landscape where two different ecosystems meet. It's a place where bias appears, a space thick with potential for harm, but is also the place where we can interrupt bias and replace it, nurturing different ways of seeing, responding, and relating to one another. In the ferment of that edge, something new can grow. The stakes are high, the repercussions are serious, and the problem is solvable. There is so much we can do. Your book is one beginning, and thank you for taking that step. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, Roxanne. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you.